guys, welcome to this next installment of With Base in Mind in Conversation With. Um, and this is going to be kind of a very surreal thing for me because uh, the guy, I always do this wrong, Sandy. I go the guy to my left, but then they see the mirror. So I only see that one. The guy to my <laughs> left, <laughs> um, Mr. Bills has one hell of a story to tell. Um, the reason being uh, is because of one certain gig with one certain boy band um, that the figures are absolutely mind-blowing. So before I kind of introduce this chap and let him take the floor and we can have a chat and talk about life and times of Sandy Bills, uh, what I want to do is do this. Um, Midnight Memories. Midnight Memories was released in uh, 2013. It was the best-selling album of the year, but the numbers which followed it are the ones which are absolutely mind-blowing. Okay, so the tour in 2014 was the highest grossing tour of the year okay um it was the 15th highest grossing tour of all time grossing over 290.2 don't forget the point two uh million us dollars um the album as a result sold over 70 million copies worldwide streams downloads um and probably boot fairs and one pound bargain bins these days um that was a dig all right <laughs> no, it's all good um the uh, the band received over 200 awards as a result which goes from brit awards to mtv music awards and american music awards forbes actually said that the estimated earning of the individuals of the band was 75 million us dollars each the second highest earning band under 30 years old of all time. One Direction. Um, and I'm honoured because this devilishly handsome young man is standing to uh, my left, who's got more glitter. And, I, I feel like I need to put more equipment in the background <laughs> just, to, just to make sure that I've got more stuff on the show. Um, it's Sandy Bill. Sandy, welcome. And uh, thanks for joining me here uh, uh, with Bass in Mind, mate. Hello, mate. How you doing? I'm all right. Nice I'm all right. I, I said to um, I said to my other half, I said, "Oh, I got got Sandy Bills coming in today for a chat," and she went, "Who's that then?" Yeah. And I went, <laughs> you know, he's he's I know him through the Overwater gang because he's got an Overwater. Um, actually, we already spoke about this earlier on. The first time I ever saw you pop up on social media was because of a proposal. It wasn't to me; it was to your missus. Um, <laughs> and and actually, Avalon, which is I can see it over your right shoulder on yeah. top of the UBS. We both use the same preamp. Um, and I turned to Kelly, I was like, oh, well, he does, uh, he did the One Direction gig. And then, thanks, mate, I really appreciated watching my, my missus just kind of go a little bit giddy at the knees and <laughs> basically forgot who I was. Um, Amazing. Yeah, I know, right? So it's good. This is Andy. Um, the numbers I've just reeled off are, are absolutely mind blowing. I mean, you've, you've kind of, in a very short period of time as a young man, you've, you've, lived a life that most people would dream about and i'm talking wembley stadium i'm talking madison square gardens i'm talking it's it's come on this is the real deal this is absolutely amazing um but i'm going to kind of do what i do with everybody i'm not interested in that i can't believe i'm saying that um, <laughs> you're sitting there with 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 all the bases and having a happy time and that sort of stuff. And i'm going to go now nah, we're not going to talk about that. Just dismiss uh, my entire career. Just, yeah, cheers, mate. Don't worry about that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> don't, don't worry. That's what everybody's been doing to me all my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Um, but I want to get to know you. I want to talk about your story. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, so much of what strings do you use and all that sort of stuff. What I want to know is how a kid goes, oh, I'm going to play bass, to get in on some of the biggest stages this world has. Mm. in front of the biggest audiences this world's seen in the last 20 years. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested about that path, you know, because a lot of people, we, we speak about it. I, I uh, actually, for the viewers uh, checking in now and looking at this, we spoke about this or informally before we started the recording. And that was, I said, look, I, I started playing at 17. It's like, it's like my 20, it's like a oh, quarter of a century. Oh, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> I've been, 25 years smacking around on a bass guitar now and you know when I started playing I did the same as everybody I was doing the pubs I was doing the tribute bands then I started doing function bands and they became corporate bands I started going around the world and then I got some 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 offshot tv stuff and mime work and that lot and my life changed when I studied with Jeff Berlin in 2007 now I'm not I've never said that I'm anything other than an incredibly hardworking individual. 
Okay, I don't try to be the next Jaco Pastoris. I don't want to be the next Jeff Berlin. Um, sorry, Sandy, I don't want to be the next Sandy Bills. Okay, I just want to be me and the best interpretation of me I can be. But everything I am proud of, everything I am proud of, came after I studied in America for two years. And that is by no means coincidence. I started writing for Bass Player Magazine, Bass Guitar Magazine at the time. I taught at the Bass Institute in London. I was there for six years, which I believe you were once a formal student of. Um, yeah. um, from that, all the credits that I'm proud of, the you know the studio stuff that then came as a result of that, and then things like my own bass guitars and working with SBL, all that stuff with Scott, all of that came after I went to the States. So if a student came to me today, and I'm not in the universities doing what I did, you know, I'm doing with bass in mind now, but they came to me now and said what was the, the the pivotal thing the seminal thing in your career um what would you tell people to do and i would go well i went for a lesson with lawrence cotton and lawrence went you know who do you want to play like and i said jeff berlin and he went why are you here then <laughs> jeff teaches get on a plane and go and learn with him. so that's what i did and i just went out to the states i'd say to guys this is what you should do well from a different generation perspective and stuff like that, with One Direction, the X Factor generation, and all that wonderful publicity you came with, and it's all positive. It's absolutely fabulous to see. Mm. You were right at the front of that man. You were right at the sharp end, okay? You were at the fuzzy end of the stick on that one, my friend. <laughs> um, let's talk pre One Direction. And tell me about Sandy leading up to that gig. Tell me about your education. Tell me about um, the path you took and to becoming a professional musician, because look, mate, you're sitting in a room now with spoils on the background and instruments around you that people dream about. Yeah. What was your first step that you think get into that plateau? So I guess I'll go back right to the start, just because I think early formative years often aren't necessarily spoke about as much. And I think those early years, whatever age that may be, when people start first taking up the bass or any instrument, I think go a long way, whether we know it or not. I think those early years, like we see it all the time, don't we? With kids that play an instrument and then give up after a certain amount of time. And I think there's always a reason for that, be it many different factors. Um, so I actually started relatively late. I started when I was 15. Um, and a friend is not a romantic story in any way. A friend of mine literally <laughs> had a band. A friend of mine had a band um, and they needed a bass player. They had a drummer and a guitarist and he sung and played guitar. And they, he was just like, I need a bass player for my band. Um, the first thing I said to him was, what's a bass? I had no idea, <laughs> as loads of people don't. Oh, you play the guitar, don't you? It's like, I play the bass, but okay. Um, so it was the same for me. I had no idea what a bass was. I was 15, um, but I went to my local music shop. I'm from a place in Devon called Barnstable in North Devon. Um, I went to my local music shop, picked up what I was told was a bass, you know, four strings, the low, lower sound on the guitar, um, took it home and literally it is one of those cheesy epiphany music like movie moments where it's like this is me this is what I want to do this is awesome and that was <laughs> it that was literally it I was just like this is this is incredible like why did it take me 15 years to discover this and um my mum's actually really musical she plays uh, piano and clarinet and there was always music around the house growing up um so it was always there but she'd never kind of pushed it on me or anything and I think when I was then, then when I came to like me discovering it as well, I kind of I'd already been exposed to music before actually picking up an instrument. If you know what I mean by that, I know we all have by listening and things mm -hmm. like that, but I've been exposed to music being played in my house live by a person without actually necessarily knowing. So I think that does subconsciously go in as well. But I started teach. I started um sorry teaching. I started uh, learning taking lessons from someone called Stuart Clayton. <clears throat> I'm sure you know and have heard of. I know Stewie. I work with Stewie yeah. at there that place go. on a monthly go. basis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, what are the chances? We, we're from the same home. We're from the same hometown, from the same place in Devon. I literally see an advert for based uh, teachers, like looking for students, and I'm just like, "Yep, this this looks good." And what are the chances that I land with Stuart? <laughs> and again, if that hadn't happened, if that hadn't happened. There's no way my career path would have played out the same in the same way. Maybe it would have gone different. It would have been successful in different ways. Maybe it wouldn't have been successful in different ways. But that chance meeting of like, oh, this this guy looks good. He can teach me bass. 
it's just I was taught by Stuart Clayton, who is incredible in so many different areas. Yeah, like, yeah. what an absolutely amazing bass player. And we're from this tiny town in Devon. Yeah. Anyway, so studying with Stuart and from him, I just learned so many things in those early years. And also from Flea as well. I definitely didn't have private lessons with Flea, but Flea, back, back then, I mean, just playing like all those Chili Peppers bass lines and hearing Flea and hearing the way he approached the instrument and made it not the bass in the background going boom 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 it, it wasn't that was it flea was like let's make the bass right in the front of the mix let's play and it was just like yeah this is great i want to get into this so that kind of really kicked off the whole thing of the bass doesn't just have to be this thing that sits at the back you can actually be expressive with it as well so that was great um I know I went to study music at university, so I went to Bass Tech in Acton, which is, I think, a common ground for us. You studied there a few years I'm, before me. I'm starting to wonder whether we're related at the moment. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about that in a second. But go on. Okay, all right. Okay, this is cool. Um, so <laughs> studied at Bass Tech, um, and at Bass Tech, I met so many like-minded people. I had this thing, like, obviously, like I say, from coming from a relatively small place in Devon, there wasn't loads and loads and loads of musicians around. I, had, I was in some amazing bands, which was so much fun, but coming like going to bass tech suddenly i was surrounded by all these like-minded musicians yeah. and i often talk to students and people when i'm doing master classes and things about our connections and how our connections are key and i it's not my analogy i can't remember who i stole it from ages ago but thinking of it like a spider web like you're the spider in the web every connection you make is that extra bit of your spider web extra bit of your spider web and they've got their own webs which is this bigger connection so suddenly we're in the middle of this thing and it's a giant connection and some of my friends who I studied with, some of my best friends now, which is amazing from a personal level as well, but some of which whom I've worked with as well, still work with in the music industry. Some people have gone on to do crazy things. So it's amazing the amount of people you meet. And one thing I will stress to the young musicians amongst us is you never know who's gonna be where. You never know which person in the room is gonna go on to do certain things in certain places and go on to do massive things. You don't know who that person is. and just because maybe right now, or maybe they're not quite at the technical level or whatever level it is, they could go anywhere. So surrounding yourself by people and always representing yourself, everything you do, do it 100% because people want to remember this 100% version of you. If you're turning up, you're half prepped, you're half ready, you're on 50%, 70%, people don't know you have that extra gear. They're just seeing you at face value of like, oh, this is who that person is, okay. Whereas if they're always seeing you 100%, they know, you know, you've always given your all and they're always seeing that 100% version of you. Why would you sell yourself short? Um, so for me, this is kind of a really long way of answering your question, but a big thing, and I know people have said this to you before from seeing some of your other interviews, um, preparation goes a massive way. Now, playing our instrument, of course, is an absolute given. We have to have technique down. We have to be adapted with different genres, different styles, different techniques on the bass. Of course, that's a given. That goes without saying. Um, we have to fit into these musical situations and be able to adapt and respond when an MD gives us direction or an artist. Um, but preparation is something that is completely in our hands. If we're fully prepped, if we're fully ready for the musical situation, A, it alleviates a lot of different nerves that we might have from a performance and leaves like, any performance nerves, nerves that might be left, at least it's not about the material. And B, again, we know we're representing ourselves to that full amount. We, we know we're fully prepped. We fully learn a tune. I cannot tell you for some auditions how many times I have played one track just over and over and over again, absorbing it. First thing, wake up in the morning, put it on, listen to it without the bass in my hand, try it, play it, play it with just a click, play it without the track even there, and then reference that against the track. Um, constantly over and over and over and over again, fully prepped. Because by the time I step onto that stage, I don't want to be thinking what the first chord of the middle A is. That's the last thing I want to be thinking of. Um, as we know, so many technical things can go on, so many technical things can potentially happen at a gig. The last thing we want to be worrying about is what what notes we're playing and how we're playing them. So yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's there's so much even you know, I'm, I'm sitting kind of okay, hang on a second. There's, there's quite a few things I want to quantify there. <laughs> um, let's let's First of all, the preparation thing. Um, the amount of times that, again, you get a bit. Of, I, I got called a, a session veteran the other day. I, oh yeah, I'm, all I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I know I'm 42 this month, but I don't want to be a veteran just yet. Okay, but <laughs> the amount of times people say to you, 
do you still get nervous when you go on stage? And you've had some of the biggest gigs, you know, on the planet. Right. I always come up with the same answer. And I always turn around and say, no, actually, when I go on stage, that's the one time that I'm not nervous. Yeah. Because when I'm on stage and the bass is around my neck, I control that area. Mm. The thing that I don't like is meeting people for the first time because uh, I'm, you know, whether or not what you think of yourself or whether or not, you know, that sort of anxieties and that sort of stuff. Um, the traffic going to a gig, um, driving right. home after a gig, am I going to fall asleep at the wheel? All right. that sort of stuff. They're the things that I worry about, not actually on stage, because the one thing that I've always prepared for is being on stage. Mm. Um, there's two things there um, that, that I really liked and I can immediately relate to. Um, the first thing is those seminal people that make a massive impact with you earlier on. Um, they really do set the trend for how you conduct your life and how you go about it. Now, you were mm. blessed with one of, I mean, Stuart Clayton, first of all, baseline publications, probably the biggest industry standard publisher of books. Um, I wish he would publish my books for me because I'd probably sell more. Um, <laughs> Stuart, Let's have a word. Yeah, he's Stuart, he's, Stuart if you're listening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, you know, he oversees all the stuff at Base Player Magazine, the notation, right. which is he basically proofreads my column as well as writing his own column. Brilliant. Um, Stu's the man. He's absolutely brilliant. Mm. But having that sort of prowess as your role model that earlier on mm -hmm. is absolutely epic. And like I said, a bit of stroke of luck that the only two bass players in, in town and, that, and that's who it turns out to be. Yeah. But the same thing. I, I, was, I picked up a bass when I was 17 um, out of jealousy. All my mates were in bands. I didn't know what to do. I got inspired. I didn't know what a musician was because I wanted to be a sports physiotherapist. I had right. no interest in the music industry. Um, I'm not a massive, I've got to be careful what I say because the information that I say may be out of date. Okay. Um, things change and academia has driven forward massively. But I see a lot of flaws in certain criteria that's delivered at music schools um, that I see personally. Um, and I might criticize some things, you know, some skills being neglected. Sight reading is one of those ones which always comes up. Um, but there's a massive benefit and it's one of the biggest benefits about going to music school. And that is you framed it perfectly. You're only as good as your phone book, you know. Right. And you, when you go to a music school, you are absolutely enveloped by everybody that not only is shaping your career, but will probably shape your career for the next 20 years. You know, totally. the, the people that you go to student bars with, the people you go to jams with, you do exams with, all that sort of stuff they end up being people on the professional circuit exactly the same as you. Um, only last week I was in a, a, a Skype chat um, with, with Ian King. We spoke about Ian just recently mm -hmm. and Dave Marks. Right. I've known Dave Marks since 2000, oh, crikey, 97, 98. Um, you know, it's over 20 years now we've been in each other's lives. I don't even like the guy. No, I'm joking. No, but, <laughs> you know, Dave, Dave is always there. And it's because we grew up in the same generation. Right. We work to the same goals and we've been in the same circuits. And as you see people grow, you're growing at the same time at the same yeah. sort of rate. So for me, going to music schools, for any young kids, yes, they're expensive. Yes, right now with, with the scenario that we're under, it might be a little bit pushy. You know how much, how many applica you know job opportunities are there afterwards in the performance world? This music industry is huge, but it's suffering at the moment. There's no advice. You know, I'm not being negative, but devil's advocate. I'm just saying it as it is. Um, but the benefits of going to tech, ACM, you know, and and all these places are great purely because of the social networks. And mm. your job is all about that. Um, there's a lot of things like auditions and stuff that. Um, Sometimes a lot of these schools, they have in-house promotion teams that, that go, okay, Sandy, uh, look, we've got a, a, a gig come up for this band. Uh, we need a couple of bass players with this criteria. We think you could fit it. And then they push you forward. You right. know, that they have marketing teams to really kind of shape people's careers. Um, when I was at college, I remember the advert and it was base tech, get good. <laughs> it was no career. It was just about getting good. And that was, it would have been under the same key. Get, get better. Yeah, get better. Um, attempt to make progress. Um, you know, was under, you know, I was studying under like Rob Burns and Paul Scott and all those guys at tech. Yeah. Um, and then the schools evolved. Um, you were at tech as well. Uh, we're talking early noughties. The 1D stuff kicked off 
later noughties. Um, how did it come around? Tell me about the auditioning process. So after leaving, so it was a little bit further than that. So 2005, yeah. 2008 is when I studied and I started yeah. with 1D 2011. I'm really incompetent at maths. No, no, no. It's just, it's, <laughs> we're musicians. It's yeah. all good. It's all One, good. Two, three, four, yeah. I know notes. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. We've got our notes. That's all we need to know. Um, <laughs> So yeah, 2005 to 2008, um, I very much, this is one thing I say to everyone, and this is one thing I kind of can't stress enough, and pe I think people are probably sick of hearing it from me, anyone who's seen anything before, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's what I believe in. Um, saying yes to opportunities, and saying yes to all opportunities, um, again, because you never know where it's going to go, you never know where it's going to lead, and that's something that I did. Um, 2008 well even before I left but during the time 2006 2007 2008 every opportunity that came my way I would say yes to every gig every recording thing every showcase no matter what it was the answer was yes it was like yeah I'll do it and it led to some amazing gigs it led to some terrible gigs as you know <laughs> like sometimes you're, you're driving back down as the A1 I know. It, 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 <laughs> every professional musician I, we, we could not speak to a professional musician who hasn't done a terrible gig it's impossible seen my CV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking way before that so you know what it's like down the A1 at 5 a.m the sun's coming up yeah, you have you've done a gig that maybe you haven't particularly loved and you're just like what am I doing am yeah. I doing the right thing here um but <laughs> this is not a negative thing. So there were some gigs, but every single time the bass was in my hand, I was learning something. Yeah. I was picking something up, maybe from the people around me, maybe from the scenario, maybe from my own self, my playing, my professionalism, whatever it was, every time that bass was on my neck, it was a learning curve and yeah. something could be taken from that. Maybe not, I couldn't maybe pinpoint what that was. I couldn't say, oh, I learned this today, but everything was a learning curve. And <laughs> the people around you, you learn so much and good and bad. You see some great things. You're like, oh, this person's wicked because of this. You see some things on the flip side and you think, I'm going to make sure I don't put myself in that situation or I don't want to give off that kind of thing. And <laughs> it's tricky because we have to be ourselves and we have to be authentic. And I think sometimes people feel like they have to be a certain way or fit into a certain thing. But being yourself is the easiest thing in the world, isn't it? Being yourself is easy because that's who we are. But trying to be someone else must be exhausting. And I'm not saying I'm not completely um, not guilty of that. Of course, there's times where I'm like, oh, I want to fit into that situation. I'm going to be a little bit more this way, or a little bit more that way. But at the end of the day, we get to the point we get to from being ourselves and having our own authenticity. And I think we can learn a lot from the people around us. And a friend of mine, um, I know that you know as well, Ian Allison, um, he's got a really good, this is something I talk about a lot anyway, but he's got a really good thing when he talks about not being afraid to ask questions. And this is a massive thing. If you don't understand something, ask a question and say, hey, I actually don't quite get that. Can you run that past me? So much better than just pretending you know it. And then later on down the line, it gets, you get unstuck with it again. Just ask that question. Mm -hmm. So if someone says something in particular and you just say, actually, I don't quite understand what's going on there. You get something, don't you? You gain a skill, you learn yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's so important, sorry. I don't know. Yesterday, sorry. Um, uh, I think Mo Foster. Uh, he he describes it as the University of the M6, uh, <laughs> which I think I think everyone can relate to. Right. I guess, like you say, I think every every piece of music history. I, I'm I'm a proper history geek. I love it, and um, the amount of books that I've read, like you know, not whilst driving, but whilst on a bus or something. Through, right. It's it's awesome. It's a great time for growth. You know. So. Um, totally. And you've got to earn your stripes. Uh, you know, you, you've got to put yourself in the wrong environments to get the right environments to realize what you're good at, what you're bad at. Not personality, just actual professional strengths. Yeah. Um, at different points in my career, I've, I've been, I, I've, I've become a victim to my own shortcomings. Um, in my early twenties, I didn't play synth bass, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of pop gigs I was going for where having some chops on the Moog was a big mm. thing, you know, mm. and that passed me by. Now, um, I'm a little bit grey around the eaves these days and uh, a little, the, the pop gigs aren't coming quite as many as they used to. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I've, found, I've found, you know, my happy place. Um, but now the gigs, the instrumentation is becoming much more double bass and electric. That could be clientele. That could, I don't know why that is. Um, but now I'm finding that my career was starting to suffer because I didn't have ARCO skills. Right. And so it's always interesting. You talk about earning your stripes, but then I always, I always look at students and say, okay, we're, 
what environment are you in now? What are the skill sets you need to develop today? You know, yeah. um, I mean, it, it, you've, you've obviously got some simp stuff. Um, yeah. Um, and big part, and you're actually doubling now. And we actually spoke about that exact thing prior mm-hmm. to this, about how, you know, that affects your, not just your working environment, but the, the gigs and stuff that you get called for. Yeah, absolutely. Like for me, this is a, something that I impart a lot on young musicians as well. The importance of synth and the importance of being able to fit your skills on the synth into what you do bass wise as well. And I think also because of the nature of the music that is outputted in different eras and different generations. Um, like we like you think about with kind of like Pino and Paul Young and that fretless OC2 kind of thing from back yeah, in man. the day. And like that was the sound for a while, wasn't it? And it was amazing. And I'm not saying that everyone was doing it, but obviously but that was quite prolific and a lot of effects. Were, yeah. Right. And I bet a load of people were like, hang on, this is really cool. And then yeah. we look at um obviously like with those the Peter Gabriel stuff as well, with all that kind of thing. Like amazing, amazing, amazing music and amazingly well played and all these things. And it kind of becomes a sound of not a sound of the times, but that of that fair. era. That's it comes fair. in, doesn't it? Um so my point behind that was I always really encourage my students to to get a grounding on synth bass because a lot of the times in music these days, there's that electronic music influence, isn't there? We'll hear like big sub drops, we'll hear big, heavy, kind of held bass notes. We might get something like 24 karat magic, where it's I think it literally is a move on that track. Yeah, um, it is, yeah. And it's 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 it would be it's not impossible, but it's very hard to get close to that on an electric bass. And again, to, to go back to Ian, Ian Allison, like he does some amazing things getting the pedals to sound close to a synth bass, and it's incredible and it's a good option. But I think having that and having that in our toolbox, and I've done auditions as well where obviously you have to have the move there, and that kind of really crept itself into the one D set over the last three years that we did. Um became more and more prevalent. And I think near the end, I was doing about 50% on that. Yeah. Um, just, that, just that big, fat yeah, sound. Yeah, yeah. This it's, thing it's, is analog. You have to tune it. It's not like yeah. <laughs> where you turn it on. Like this one, it's cool. You turn it on, it's good to go. That one, you've got to tune it and it adapts to the different scenario, like the different um, temperatures around you and whatever's going on. So for me, it's so important to get used to that. And even just a basic knowledge of programming synthesis and something that's something that I've worked on over the last year when I've had more time at home, yeah. working more on programming and a bit more on the synthesis of it. But it's a massive tool to have and it, oh, it yeah. adds a massive to your tonal palette. And why not? If an MD in a rehearsal suddenly goes, oh, yeah, let's get that in there. You're like, cool, moog, bang. And that's where I've got a few pedals I'm going to talk about later on. But that's where something simple like this, yeah, line a simple LS2 line selector, you can have however you want it. I, I normally have uh, green as my electric bass. So that would be bang on 12 o'clock. And then my red as my synth bass, which will have balance against that. Um, if I've only got one line at a gig, I'll take an LS2, balance my synth bass against my electric bass. I'm good to go. I can switch between that kind of classic thing of verses on electric, chorus yeah, is on synth. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I did the same, I've, I did the same with, with fretted and fretless into the LS right. and switch right. between the two. Um, and then I found out that it, it it, it, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the shortcomings of that another time when you put right. it in, <laughs> or you, you're plugged into the wrong out and then both both right. bases are live. That's a right. common one with me. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm amazingly efficient at being inefficient, Sandy. <laughs> it's, 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 consistently, it's, consistently inefficient. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's great. <laughs> um, there's there's um, the same thing, like I said, and that that getting those chops together is is a big part that does kind of not shoebox you but it makes you available for certain gigs right um how did the how did the 1d thing first come on your horizon talk to me about that yeah so uh, yeah i'll pick back up on the story um right. so i, mean, I always <laughs> go off like that i'll always go off on tangents you have to get me back uh, on path. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so from saying yes to everything loads of different opportunities started happening uh tours here and there um small european stuff small uk stuff yeah. But just building, building that base, building like knowing people and playing with people, et cetera, et cetera. And then started auditioning more and more. Um, and this led to other things, again, meeting more people and again, learning from the experience, being terrible at auditions and coming away from it, feeling really deflated. But then thinking, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen again. Like what went wrong there? Why did it go wrong? I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen again um, because I've missed an opportunity there. And some might, I guess I can now look back and say that was my learning curve. That was important for me to go through in order to where I got to. And you hear a lot of people talk about luck. Um, I don't believe in luck. I believe in fortunate situations and fortunate events happening. And for me, 
um, all this hard work, all this dedication, and this kind of fortunate event met at this point. And yeah. for me, it was the One Direction audition. And before that, I'd done a few TV things, a few a few other things, like I say, a few tours with singer songwriters, etc. But nothing even close to this scale. And for me, one of my career dreams, my career goals was just to play with a number one artist or a top 10 artist was like, that was, for me, that was just like an amazing thing. Um, so the audition process, pretty full on heavy, two days of audition. The first day, there was loads of us. The second day, um, there was only five of us. Uh, the keys player and the drummer were pretty set at that point. Um, and then, yeah, there was two guitarists, two bass players, and then so it was game time. It was either us or the person next to us that was getting the gig. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a full on day, loads of different things thrown at us, loads of different scenarios put into different musical things, different combinations between us. And then eventually we're in the room and the MD comes in and says, congratulations, you are One Direction's band. And obviously just an incredible feeling of like, mm -hmm. this is what I worked for at this moment right now. I felt like I was on the X Factor. It's like, I feel like I'm the person being told you win. And it's just, it, I can't stress enough how much went into that moment. And yes, the opportunity was there. That opportunity was there, but that hard work meeting it at that point. And for me, that was the point. And we've all got that point. And I, I think it's so important for people to realize that opportunity is a phone call away. That opportunity could be tomorrow. That opportunity could be in five years time. The opportunity could be in 10 years time. There is that opportunity there that can surface itself at any point yeah, we do yeah. not know when that's going to happen. We don't know that person, that connection. You know what it's like. You'll get a call from someone you worked from four years ago. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I didn't even know you still knew who I was. Well, like, there's, why are you calling me? There's, there's a wonderful analogy. And I think I actually, I did this. Um, I dropped my mic. I told you, inefficient. All good. Um, All good. I did, um, uh, I think I talked about this once on a podcast, um, the, kind of when I first started working for Scott Devine, but when I was just a bassist, as opposed to part of the SBL family. Mm -hmm. Um, and I talked about how, yeah, you about the opportunities arise when you just don't expect them to. Yeah. Um, there's, and also when you think, you know, you're past it. I mean, I'm not going to say past the point, but certain gigs, you don't appreciate what comes at what point in your life. Um, Neil Fairclough, currently Queens bass player, uh, Adam Lambert, mm -hmm. Uber bass player. He didn't get a gig with Queen till he's 42. Now, Incredible. A lot of people, that's, that's no thats no age, I'm 42 this month. But um, the point is, is that, you know, some, some people might go, oh, you know, the, the, the opportunities need to happen when you're younger. Um, I'm going to draw everyone's attention to Michael Caine's biography. Now, I did say this before, it's another story that I've told. Um, Michael Caine, if you get Maurice Whittlebeat's uh, autobiography, he talks about receiving a script from Christopher Noland. And he read it, and then he contacted Chris and said, um, thanks for the offer of this movie role, Chris. Um, that's how he talked to Mr. Noland. Uh, <laughs> thanks for this offer. No, okay. Um, and he said, uh, I think I'm a little bit too old to play Batman. Just just imagine that for a sec, Michael Caine in the, yeah. And, um, and then Christopher Nolan said, well, hang on a second, Michael, I want you not to play Batman. I want you to play the father figure of, you know, Alfred the butler. And Michael Caine said, ah, and for the very first time he went upstairs, he looked in the bathroom mirror and rather than seeing the leading man, he saw the leading man's father looking back wow. at him. And wow. the moral of the story is, is you're never too old to play any part. Mm. In fact, you could be too young mm. because you can't be Christian Bale's dad until you're old enough to play his dad. Amazing. And so for everybody watching this, and I do, you know, Sandy, you're a handsome man. You've got some stuff going on. You've got, you, you know, you a great gig with arguably one of the biggest bands that the world's seen post Beatles, you know, and stuff like that. But um, it's quite possible that you might get a gig with an old timer who's retired in your 60s and it might end up being the biggest gig of your life. But right. Because you were appropriate for that gig at the appropriate time in your life. You yeah. know, and that's all good. The, the audition happened. Yeah. You've got the gig. That's a yeah. boss, man. That's, that's a, that's oh, a, man. that's, if you're ever going to have a boast, uh, that's going to be one that you can have a strut. Um, you went on to the rehearsal process. How did this go? Because you've got, you've got an established band that, you know, when the lads were put together, we kind of, we all feel like they were part of this, that story. You know, <laughs> we've seen the amalgamation of these personalities and they've become a product. 
now you're coming in and realizing you're the next part of that product that people mm. can see. Um, tell me about the, the actual the rehearsal process. So this is how, you know, there's material that's unreleased. You know, there's material which is being fit. You know, the first, the biggest uh, American US number one of the year opening debut single for uh, of uh, One Direction. But how do you how do you prepare for that? How did you go into the environment and go right? So this is actually going to be me. People are going to know me for doing this. Um, right. So tell me about your mindset. Well, it's kind of weird because, like I said, with the whole kind of putting myself forward and 100% from everything up until that point, mm. I just did the same thing. And I know that sounds ridiculous because I'm doing it on so much of a bigger scale, but I just did what I'd always done and made sure that everything was prepped to that nth degree. Um, so in that way, it was actually quite easy to slot into it because it's like, well, I've already been doing this. I've already been putting all my my all into my music. So, yes, it's doing it on a much bigger scale, much bigger stage, much bigger scale. But it's still that same thing and that same core skills. And I think, again, it's almost the preparation of preparation, getting you ready for that thing of like, well, I've already been doing that same thing. So obviously the stakes were higher and things like I know you spoke about this in some of your other interviews as well things like moving to in ears um yeah, from yeah. Being so used to wedges being so used to cabs and all these different things moving to in ears um and having that but obviously with the 1d thing we had to have in in ear monitors because the fans were so loud and so crazy <laughs> every single night you couldn't take the ears out you had to have your ears in um and that's why that was obviously a really important thing for the monitoring to have our in-ear monitors. So that was obviously a bit of an ad adaptation for that. But as far as the rehearsals go, obviously the music, we just had to be just so on it. Like night one hits, we had to be so on it. And it's important to note that not no one knew how big it was all going to be, well, our, this, ourselves included. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you say that, but this is kind of what I'm I'm scratching at, trying to get something out of you because... You know, I, I speak to Mo Foster and um, a lot of guys that were seminal at the beginning of a lot of projects. And they will say to me, yeah, Phil, you know, you've got to remember at the time we didn't know how big it was going to be. 100%. But that's not the case with you, mate, because I could have told you how big that gig was going to be after the TV footage. Before you even stepped in the studio to be the band, we knew it was, had some of the biggest publicity of the year around it. So it's going to be a big production it's going to be a big show does that does that change i think mindset well I, I would agree in a dis i would agree and disagree i would agree that yeah people knew that it was obviously of course the boys had something magic in their chemistry yeah. and what they were doing of course and it was definitely destined for big things but the global worldwide oh. thing that happened i i would be hard pressed for anyone to have predicted that it would go that massive like obviously everyone wanted it to we all wanted to of course we did um, is, but for then for it to go that massive is amazing if we're ever going to share moments first of all there's the dream that's <laughs> Wembley oh, holy man. crap Sandy I mean that, that was my view almost just to give is, you a slightly to the left that is my view every yeah, night that is off the hook so yeah. first of all sell out there now let's go if I if you said to me Three places. Well, I'm lucky enough I did play the O2, so I've done the Dome. That's nice. But I'd go Wembley and Madison. And these are the images you've got of Madison oh, wow. Square Gardens. I mean, are you kidding me? That is yeah. absolutely... And, and the audience is, what, 99.9% .9 female screaming at you there. Um, it's <laughs> yeah. gonna, it's a, it, that was an interesting thing you said about the change of equipment because I remember reading yeah. John Lennon's autobiography and he was talking about playing you know, Shea Stadium with the Beatles and stuff like that, that those infamous gigs. And he said it was absolutely pointless being on stage because we, we could have done anything. We couldn't hear past the noise. Right. Um, this is great for you because obviously, like I said, you've got a large percent on Moog. You've got, so, well, sorry, say, I'll say synth. Um, and then cool. electric. There's a lot of things going on. You've got, got the LS2 switching. Now, we referenced Ian. Um, and Ian's a don. I love him. He's absolutely mm. good. But a lot of people, and to reference a bit what Dave Swift was talking about recently, there's a lot of stuff you can do at home. And I can get a great sound out of my bass because I'm using LS2 and this pedal and this pedal. But then the actual practicalities of doing that in front of 86,000 people. Right, right. You've just got to go, no, I need to learn this on synth. And the, the isolation is going to, surely it's going to benefit that massively, no? 
Yeah, massively. And and the consistency as well. Yeah. If we think about every night, you know what it's like, different arenas, different stadiums, different places have got different fields, haven't they? So for having the in-ear monitors, we get closer to that consistency. Of course, we still need to make tweaks for slapback, et cetera, but we've got that more consistent sound of, okay, this is how it's going to be. And especially running scenes with the mons, we know that a certain song, the click's going to come down or a certain song, the bass is going to go up, et cetera, et cetera. And we can set that. So we know it's a consistent thing every night. Um, and that helps massively. But yeah, it, it's, it is that thing of like stepping on stage and being like the first few times you do it, you're like, oh, this isn't rehearsal room or this isn't my bedroom anymore. There's actually people now listening and watching about this. And it's just, it is that extra level. But again, I will say to people, and this is genuine and people aren't going to believe me, but whatever, it is easier to play 100,000 than it is to play 10. It's easier for me to play to 100. Yeah, people you see there, um, I'm looking over to my other monitors here, by the way. So if you see me looking over here, I'm not just You're zoning okay, out. Man. You're okay. um, so yeah, that exactly like that picture there, you can see all those people behind. Um, that is easier than playing to 10 people. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm yeah, exactly. You agree. Because 10 people, they're right in front of you, their eyeballs are right there. Whereas a hundred thousand is a hundred thousand. And even from that shot that you just showed there, the closest person I'm to is pretty far away. Um, so from that point of view, it is actually honestly easier. Um, obviously. There is so much that can happen in a live show and so many different things that can happen. And this is why versatility is important. If something does go wrong and if something, maybe a technical mishap or whatever happens, which when we're working with tech, it's going to happen, isn't it? At some point, something's going to go wrong. It happens all the time. Um, so how we deal with this? And I, I talk about this quite a lot, but things like when something goes wrong, what do you do? Do you shout at the people around you? Do you start getting annoyed with people? Do you shout at the text? Do you shout at whoever it is? Or do you keep doing your gig? Do you keep being professional? Do you keep playing? Do you keep doing what you're doing and have faith in the team behind you? They're going to sort it out. Of course, that's what you do. You trust your team. You know how good they are. The people who are behind the scenes as well. They are going to sort out any problem. And it always happens. Whenever that's happened, I've had a few times my wireless pack's gone down. I just keep playing as if nothing's different. And then someone like either the bass tech or the mons will come and sort it out. It's fine. It's all good. We're sorted. And you just roll with it. You roll with these situations because being being a good person goes a long way. And I think that gets lost over time. People yeah. see certain things and certain characteristics and certain qualities from people. And they think, oh, I have to be really aloof and really like, I don't know, really kind of, I've got to be guarded and not let people in on my secrets and all these things of like, I've got to create this persona of like, I'm this musician and I'm untouchable. It's like, well, no, actually being human and having a human aspect to you is is so much more important, I feel like, than so many other things. Because, Phil, if I was to say to you right now, put a tour together, um, pick me a drummer, a guitarist and a vocalist, I can almost guarantee you are going to pick people you like to hang out with, right? Of course, yeah. Two months on the road, you're not, you're not straight away thinking, who's the best drummer I know technically? Do you know what I mean? That, I'm sure that wasn't your, your thinking. No, hang on, who's, who's a really good player? But someone also ah. that I want to spend two months with on a tour bus, in flights, in hotel rooms, I, I can, all that stuff. I can tell you now, it's whoever's got a Netflix account, um, <laughs> whoever can go pancakes, Here we go. Here and who's, we go. Who's, who's ever willing to go to the BP 24 hour petrol station at three in the morning. Um, if you tick those boxes, I'm booking you. Um, so there we go. <laughs> you heard it here first. Phil, Phil Man exclusive. <laughs> Wow, I wonder why I'm lonely. Oh, right, okay, no. <laughs> um, actually, let's talk about, because there's, there's a nice thing there, because, and I do, there's, we talk about, you know, uh, social media and the web, and then we talk about the evolution of that, but there's been a massive digital step forward with equipment in, in mm. the last two decades. Now, mm. um, I'm not saying that I'm so old that I need a quill when I write, um, but um, I, I am blessed with being completely analog so i i literally i mean i'm, I'm a, you know i talk to jeff berlin these days and he's just about managing to use a laptop and and do video calls and stuff like that right because we've got to remember he's a 70 year old guy and i right. love him to death and but there's things that you have to learn there's skill sets that you have to learn mm -hmm. it's not that they're not capable but there are there's a generation of people now that have been born into um expectations uh, I, I remember one of my nieces getting a, getting a, uh, a magazine here's a magazine um and touching it like it was touch screen 
They didn't realize it was paper. It wasn't an iPad. Um, I grew up in a generation where I turned up with a four by 10 um, that basically broke the suspension on my car. <laughs> um, a couple of bases chucked in there, which were 90s music men that weighed more than me. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm medium husky. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and, um, <laughs> and these, 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 that was my way, you know, turn up, crank up and go for it. Now, hmm. we spoke about in-ears. Now, for the guys that aren't of that generation and are not yeah. aware of the technology, if you think about, I don't know, Live Aid, uh, the classic is always Freddy, um, uh, or at Live at Wembley with Queen, stuff like that. Massive wedges all along the front, a sea of wedges. Speakers pointing back to the musicians so they can hear themselves. In modern production, that stuff's gone now completely. Mm. And everything is on it. I'm on in ears right now. There you go. Look, there's... There you the go. So my mix is coming in, and it's 100% isolated. So even if Callie told me off from doing the hoovering right now, I couldn't hear her, and that's my excuse. <laughs> now, so... Um, but everything's changed, man. And my own stage presence has completely changed. Mm. I would go from big cabs, four tens, eight tens sometimes, believe, you know, it's ridiculous, thousand watt heads and stuff like that. And now I'm going out with a vibrating floorboard, mm. okay, from Ike and a, 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 a power amp, an Avalon preamp normally, mm -hmm. and then an in-ear system, and that's it. Right. But the thing is, is that depending on what in is I've got, um, it changes the tone that I'm expecting from the bass. You know, when I'm using mm. like an old, like, I don't know, you've got the an, an EBS behind you. I used to have the old uh, HD 350s, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, yeah, that. me too. Also had the the Dave Eden uh, 410 XLDs. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that high end precision cabs. You're used to hearing the ambience from the cabs. You're mm. used to the way that the speaker, you know, interacts with your strings, your pickups and that lot. And then that's completely gone. Mm. And then I find myself on stage with what a two millimeter driver in my ear. Everything changed. I had to change string manufacturers. I changed the pickups in all of my bases. Um, Music Man actually worked great on it is. I really mm. noticed that as they were stock. But my designs, you know, my, my own signature models, I had to go to second generation because the gig had changed. All my equipment changed. You know, um, I don't have that rig anymore my mm -hmm. my rig is literally it's tiny i could turn up for mm -hmm. a, a stadium concert with a backpack it's it's crazy um how did how did that side of things affect you because you've done a you know a stadium sized tour worldwide as we said 2014 biggest tour of the year absolutely epic 290 million i think was the number I said. <laughs> and the only reason i'm saying that, i'm not trying to play the trump card and woe is me and all this stuff but what i'm saying is this is a big deal mm. right? how did the technology how did you interact with that what did you end up using why because like i said i had to change preamps and everything because of how stuff sounded through my innings right how did what, what was what was like so you're you know you're at home the, the hoodie's on um i need to think about what i'm taking on the road yeah what was the next stage so I love, I love, love the prep side in the sense of actually getting ready for the gig yeah. and getting the equipment ready and getting your tools. I've got loads of pedals that I'll show you later on in front of me. Um, I love getting that kind of like, let's build a board for this gig. Let's get my gear. Let's set my sounds. I'm going to make sure everything's leveled. I'm going to go, go into logic and make sure everything's balanced level wise, all my different sounds, et cetera, et cetera. So I love that stage. Um, Later on, I might show you over, I might take a picture and send it to you about my Moog. It's got loads of stickers all over it for different sounds and different positions and stuff like that, just because that's what helps me on the live thing. Um, so getting ready for that and getting prepped and getting the sound sorted. Um, I was really lucky with the 1D gig. I always had a cab on stage um, right. and a dedicated sub as well. So we'd run my, um, I had the Fafner 2s, the EBS Fafner 2s, um, two of those, uh, the main, <laughs> this one. yeah, right there. You, you might <laughs> and see then one I used here. that <laughs> yeah. and then it was that. <laughs> yeah, so that one, that one, and then another one is a backup, which actually we never went to. The main never gave in, which is pretty incredible. Like four and a half years and then the main never giving in um yeah, no, i think that's heavy. pretty impressive um, yeah because a ABS, lot of people uh, go on sorry yeah just quickly a lot of people neil talked about that as well taking uh, he used uh, an h1000 harkies mm -hmm. and then he said i had two heads and then i had two on backup because people don't realize that they go oh well it's a solder joint no 
working a transformer at that volume for that amount of time, they die, man. They do. Right. I've gone through heads before because of stadium tours where you're really, really cranking them. Right. It's a very different stress to playing in bars and stuff. So mm-hmm. testament to EBS and how reliable they are. Totally. Sorry, buddy. Totally. Go on, keep going. Keep no, going. no, not at all. Because and he, and he said on your interview, right, he took the grills off. So it was just the bare coat. Yeah. Like, how yeah. cool is that? Like, that is epic. Um, Neil's cool. He's yeah, cool. I love that. I love I that. So, that. Um, <laughs> So I had, um, in fact, this uh, this very one, um, the 410, I'd have the 410 Pro line. Um, I am endorsed by EBS, full disclosure, um, but I've been endorsed by EBS for 11 years now, yeah. um, predating anything big I did. Um, and I, I might touch on that later on if that's all right. But yeah, okay. yeah, just, I think, an amazing company. And I think testament to them that I haven't even ever wanted to look elsewhere. But anyway. That's a separate story for a separate time. Um, Proline 410, um, two Fafners off stage, the Fafner 2 off stage, same with the Avalon. Um, but I would run a dedicated sub. And with that sub, um, because of the separation we had from the, even the musicians, we're far away from each other. We're, like sometimes we're far away from the boys, depending on where the stage is set up. I had that sub cranked to where you would not believe. Like the whole floor would vibrate every <laughs> note I played. The, the brown whole, note. yeah. <laughs> Right. So I'm guessing I've never actually had much experience with the uh, the platforms. I'm guessing it's a similar feeling, but I would have that sub so, so, so loud that the whole floor would just vibrate mm. when I play a note. And I can't tell you the feeling of standing on a stadium oh, stage, don't. a firework explodes in front of you and you hit a note on the Moog or a low E or a low C on the electric bass. And you get that moment of the whole your whole body is vibrating. You're looking up at this firework that's just exploded. The chorus has just kicked in. And the first stadium we ever did was actually in Bogota in Colombia. And I don't think I'll ever reach that kind of high from a gig again. Yeah, like man. personal life things aside, that's a different story. But from a gig, that moment when the big chorus kicked in and all those things happened, I just explained. You can't, you can't like express how that feels. And God. Oh. Again, all those years, all those things, it's almost like when you see in a movie and it's a montage of all those moments that quickly snapping by lead yeah. up to that moment. And that is it. Anyway, this was completely not your question. So no, it's okay. <laughs> I went over there. So I still had the cab on stage. Um, so that was great. And with my in-ears at that time, I was using an overwater, which is just over there. I can't grab it. It's just by that one. Um, it's, it was uh, a J5, just like this one very similar should we, should we, should we do yeah go on trump- let's do let's do our base, overwaters base top trumps <laughs> yeah there it is the p-man signature i know have you got one no no i can do you a deal uh, <laughs> no, so, no, actually um, besides the, just quickly and i, and I want to now i've got bases everywhere cheers for trashing my room sandy and i'm right so get, um, <laughs> you're welcome actually i just want to before you start going a bit further with that but that moment you just talked about there hitting the sub and then like i say reaching that high um that must have been an occurrence I, I don't know how you get used to it. i remember um that much, much smaller scale let's talk about this um but i remember i remember being on stage um one of my one of my idols growing up was albert lee and i got the gig with albert and i ended up touring with it and we did the the tune uh, uh, luxury liner which he did with emmy lou and and I, it was his playing is unbelievable, right? Yeah. It's another level, and every guitarist in the room just loses their mind. And I'm playing away, and there's it's a lot of changes. It's one of those songs that keeps modulating, right? And then we came off stage, and Albert doesn't say a lot, and he came up to me and he went, "All right, Phil," and I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Kind of lost you there for a minute, didn't I?" And and the reason was is and it was <laughs> I cocked, I made a mistake. It happens, okay. But in my defence. I was on stage and I kind of forgot I was supposed to be playing the bass. I thought <laughs> I was just like glazy eyed looking at Albert going, Oh, he's so pretty. And, 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 and I didn't, I literally lost my way in the song because I was listening to him on stage right. when I should have been supporting him. Um, right. That must've happened. You must've every now, I know the concentration goes, but for that amount of time, two hours on stage or whatever, there's a point in the night where all of a sudden reality clicks back in. And uh, and you just kind of look out and go, this is happening, man. Yeah. I mean, how talk, talk to me about your yeah. I mean, that is actually a massive thing, and I'm sure people listening from different things, bass, real life, all these other things. I'm sure you've had those moments, everyone, where you're just like, I'm living in this moment. This moment is actually happening, and I'm living in this. And I think something that's really important is giving ourselves a pat on the back. 
we're so we're so used to going oh i wish i was better at that oh i didn't do that very well oh that wasn't very good stop every now and then and give yourself a pat on the back and say you know what that was a good one nice one that was a good one well done and it's the same with social media like we touched on earlier on you'll get 500 nice comments you'll get one bad comment which one is the one that you remember it's always going to be the bad comment and we need to give ourselves this positive affirmation these pats on the back when we do achieve something and even if it's a small personal goal like oh i really wanted to nail that tune or i really wanted to get solo over these changes or whatever it is and you get to that point and like give yourself a pat on the back and then move on and strive and strive to get better but something that you mentioned then which i think is really important that we're losing as well and this is an audition tip that i would give to any any musician but young musicians and any musician um listen to the people around you listen to everyone else playing on stage we're not just there to play our part like a robot we're there because we are a human we're not a backing track where you just press play we are playing so when you're playing listen to the people around you how's how's the drummer interpreting that groove like how can you fit in with that drummer like what's the guitarist doing at that point sonically where do you fit what else is going on around you listen to the other musicians don't just i am here to play my part and here is my part that's not going to cut it that's going to cut it if you're maybe recording a really specific really all the dots really kind of charted out thing and it has to be this way maybe that's a different scenario but in a live scenario listen to the musicians around you and adapt to them so i think you getting lost in albert's playing yeah. in a weird way is actually a positive thing because it shows you were listening it's, and i think we need to it's a funny thing you talk about about the the positive reinforcement and stuff and and social networking you know and and instant gratification from the net and and taking it you know taking it on the chin when you don't get the feedback you want um yeah. it's also a very english thing and i hate to bring it right. up but there was a, a funny analogy that someone said to me when I was out in the States was over, over in Tennessee and I, I had done, I, you know, I was, okay, look, I was, I was doing some recording at some studios, which is where Elvis cut, you know, a mystery train. Right. And I, you know, I, 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 I thought, sod it. And I, I went and rented a, a Mustang and I thought, if I'm going to turn up at, at Sun, I'm going to live the dream. I'm doing yeah. it. And I was, you know, I was kind of enjoying myself. And I thought, and these guys were hanging out outside. And sort of guys that you would not want to mess with. They were kind of, I was suspicious. All of a sudden, I didn't want to be walking into the studio with a bass and turning up in, in a Cobra. And um, the guy got out and went, hey, man, is that an SS? And I went, yeah. And he goes, cool. And he came over and he was all in. And I thought to myself, the analogy is, is that in America, if you've got a really nice car, they say, that's a nice car. In the UK, they probably put a key down the side of it or something. Right. <laughs> all right. The reason I'm saying that is it's not a very English thing to say, to put on the internet, check me out you know and and it's right. you're boasting it's not the it's dropping the clangs and stuff and i think i think some some audiences misinterpret um if you're spending your life trying to achieve something you just sometimes just want to share it and yeah. you know and it's there's no malice involved it's just you know what you've done something that you're proud of and and, and i do want to say to anybody that's put stuff on the internet don't be put off because you don't want to say oh, I don't want to put this up because so-and-so might think I'm bragging yeah. or if I put this up and they think that I'm just plugging this product and stuff like that. I, we've just talked about EBS, Overwater. Neither of us really care. We're just talking. It's just and it's what we use and it exactly. is what we use day in, day out. So guys watching this, give people love. Crying out yeah. loud. This boy and I works think, hard. You know, and as, well, as well, just from, from your point as well, like don't like don't be afraid in the sense of we both know there are ways of putting things out on social media and there is a way you could put it out which yeah might be a bit bragging and a little bit like, look at me look at me look at me but equally if it inspires one person and if it gets one person to be like oh i could actually do that yeah. it's so worth it as well and i'm not saying that's the reason why we put things out all the time but it is also a byproduct and i think we need to we need to be proud of our successes and we need to stop caring necessarily about what X, Y, Z person thinks because X, Y, Z person is not going to book us on a gig anyway. If they're going to have that impression of us from what we put out, it's not necessarily the sort of person that's going to book us on a gig. So I think we need to be proud of our successes. And this goes to a lot of different things. I, I remember watching a thing ages ago about the Funk Brothers and James Jameson is my favorite bass player. Um, and I'm, I'm butchering the story and I'm sure I'm going to get a bit of it wrong, but I'm sure the guitarist from the Funk Brothers was in a diner and they were playing uh, My Girl. And um, the, and uh, 
the, I think the waitress came over and they said something like, oh, this is a really cool song. And he knew he played on the track yeah. um, and he didn't say anything. This is right, right? And he didn't yeah, say anything. Yeah, it's in the shadows of Motown. Right, right. Yeah. right. And yeah. he didn't mention it. And I just think that's so sad in the sense of like people let that get in the way of being proud. And like, I'm not saying that I, I shout about everything I do, but like, I do like to be quite kind of proactive. And if something cool happens, just put it out there. And yeah, man. hopefully then people listen to things like this and think, Oh, hang on. There's there's hopefully a bit of value in listening to working hard and prepping and doing all these things rather than if you don't, then maybe people don't necessarily get that little gem. And I'm not saying I'm like this fountain of knowledge or anything, but hopefully if you can inspire one or two people or three people, fantastic. You've done a job and you've you've shared it and it's all about paying it forward. It's all about talking to that next generation about this is what's worked for me. Hopefully some of this can work for you. Feel free to disregard 95% of it. But if you take 5%, I'm happy. Um, and if, and, I, and, and you, I love to hear these things. And if you take 5%, then Netflix's shares will now go up. After <laughs> our <own time. laughs> and listen, um, so you, you, we talked about the gear. We talked about the auditioning process. You as a person moving out. Um, there's a couple of strains. I mean, a lot of us are family men. I know you've, you've now got a beautiful little family. Um, yeah. I think this is all best post 1D though, isn't yes, it? Yes, so absolutely. Um, what, what, talk about stresses of that relentless lifestyle on the road. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm used to being thrown into the back of a transit van, not abducted, but I am um, <laughs> tearing up and down the O1 and doing that sort of stuff, or in fact, driving myself to gigs and things like that. Um, whether or not you're doing that, or whether or not you're leaving a, a five star lifestyle, the strains are, are going to be, you know, common. Tell me about surprising things. I tell you, I, I've set the scene. I remember one of the biggest tours I ever had. And I got so depressed on the road that I wasn't practicing when I was on the road. I was like, right. I was like, I don't even want to go near it, you know. And mm. and and it was because it my state of mind changed a lot from being in the bus. Um, I got awesome at Mario Kart on the Nintendo DS oh, yeah. because oh, yeah. I was just I was just in a plane all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah. Tell me about life on the road and the stresses, but. Talk to me personally, man. Talk. Don't don't, don't be afraid to. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. found this really difficult, man. I was. I remember being on the road, family member was ill and just being cut up and out of my mind because I couldn't be beside them. I couldn't look at that sort of stuff because I was on a different continent. Um, yeah. What are the sort of things that you kind of, if you don't mind, things that you don't, you, you were surprised at, at being on the road? I think one of those things that we all like to do and we all don't realise with anything is even when we see people do whatever it is, even again, not to hark back to the social media, even when we do see all these positive things on social media, everyone is still a person. Yeah. And everyone still goes through the same things. You might have what I believe was the most amazing job in the world. Like I couldn't have fathomed how amazing that job could be. Like it was the most incredible job in the world. And you still go through all the same things you're going through, regardless of where it is, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of where you are. You're still a person. So you still feel things like you say, family members getting ill. You miss you like if you're away so much, there obviously is a lot of things you miss out on weddings, funerals births all these different things um i'm very fortunate that i didn't have my family when i started all this i was 24 when i started um my daughter was born when i was 30 so it was it was so nice that for me that happened after i, I finished my big stint of touring at that mm -hmm. time so i don't think i could have coped i don't think i could have coped if i'd had my daughter then i think it would be really different um so that would have obviously been a really different thing but for me, I think because we were living that dream, because it was everything I wanted it to be, it, it was this progression. We went theatres, theatres became arenas, arenas became stadiums. And it was just this progression and this thing. And it I, I know it sounds like I'm just saying this, but it genuinely just was so amazing. Um, it was incredible. It's completely changed my life, completely changed who I am as a person in a good way. Um, but of course, there's those moments, there's those moments with anything where you get sick of certain people or you get annoyed at a certain situation or whatever it is. That is human. You can be doing anything. Something is going to annoy you at some stage. And that's completely fine. Um, I think for me, I just needed to check myself if something had, like it was like, is this is this enough of an issue? Am I annoyed enough about this for this to be a thing? And mm -hmm. if the answer was no, which almost every time <laughs> it was, it was like, all right, take stock, step back. My friend of mine, a good friend of mine, um, the musical director from One Direction, John Schoen, he, he calls it zooming out. So you zoom out, you look at the situation, especially right now, everything that's going on in life, you zoom out, you look at the situation, is it actually that bad? And obviously with that, 
It's what I always wanted to do. And I know it sounds like a kind of stock answer. Of no. Everything was amazing, but it was. And of course, there were those personal things. And I think that's what anyone who's going to get into music, anyone who listens to this that wants to become a touring musician or a working musician, A, you have to love it. You have to love it. You have to give it your all and you have to love it because otherwise it's not going to work. If, if, you don't, if you don't love it now at this stage, you don't, it's like that whole pushing through and just like, it's not going to work. You have to love it and you have to want it. You have to give it your all and you have to be willing that there's going to be certain things you're going to miss out on. Certain things in your personal life, you're going to have to say to some of your best friends, I can't be an usher at your wedding. I can't be a, a groomsman at your wedding. Th that is a sad reality of it. There are some times when you're going to have to say that. But for the flip side and for what it's worth, for me, that for, like, selfishly as it is, for me, that was worth the compromise because you get all these amazing things and it is everything you've dreamt of and it's everything. And apart from anything else, the friend understands because the friend's yeah, like, yeah, that's of it. course. The friend's <laughs> like, of course. And I think if the friend was like, oh no, whatever, it's like, okay, that's maybe not quite understanding the situation. But yeah, honestly, you have you have to be prepared that life will go on. If you're not around, life still goes on. You're, you're off around touring constantly. <clears throat> life still happens back in the UK or wherever yeah. it may be. So be prepared for that to happen. Um, well, I mean, on, on that, I think I don't think I've been invited to a wedding that I didn't play at for about the last two decades. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I, was like, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to come to your wedding. I haven't spoke to you for six years. Can you do a band? There's a surprise. Yeah, um, right. But, yeah. You know, I like that zooming out thing. I, I, you, yeah. you talk about how you can. OK, in my in my household, the glass is always half full. Um, I remember talking to John East just recently and he goes, Phil, what are you on? Uh, because I'm always half full. The, right you know zooming out stepping away from something when you're in enclosed environments being on tour i'm going to relate this to the pandemic which is kind of um i don't want to i don't want to talk about it too much that's not what we're here for but <clears throat> when you're on tour very small things can become mountains and mm. you, because of fatigue tiredness stress you know they get in the way and that, that being able to quantify things and go do you know what it's not big enough step away from it and you mm -hmm. realize um for everyone that's watching this, we are in uh, a, a very unique scenario, both socially and, and, and working, right? You know, um, professionally. Um, both of myself and Sandy are touring bass players. We're hardworking bass players, professionals for a couple of decades. Um, and I think we're probably facing, facing one of the most testing professional times that any lifetime is going to go through, probably this mm. century, let alone just us. Okay. But in the last year, I have had my 100th publication at Bass Player Magazine. I launched With Bass in Mind, which is now a full-time career, and I'm getting to hang out with gentlemen like this guy. Um, I had, Unfortunately. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> mate. Uh, he's got a Netflix <laughs> subscription. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and I had my first two number one hits because of remote studio recording. Um, they're highlights in my career that I'm going to celebrate and I'm very proud of. And just mm. because of the situation that I'm in, can everyone please make sure the glass is half full? Mm. Um, uh, I spoke to a couple of engineers. They said, oh, you know, how are you getting on with, with lockdown and stuff? And they said, dude, I'm an engineer. I've been in a dark room doing the mix for the last 30 years. Nothing has changed. For right. Me. So just, just make sure that the glass is half full, guys, and keep mm -hmm. working towards what you want to do. If anything, now you've got time on your hands to make sure it is done, which reminds me I really should publish my third book. Right, anyway, <laughs> listen. Um, just, so, just quickly on that point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people are really keen to be like you have to fill every second of your time when we're, when we're in when we're at home and doing all this stuff and i think there it's important to set goals and it's important to work on things we're weak at so this is inside and outside of what we're going through right now but mm. what are our weaknesses identify our weaknesses we're so good at just sitting down with a bass in our hand and playing things that we know we're good at that's yeah. just so easy to do that but what are we not so good at what are our weaknesses let's identify them and work on them like if i was to give myself a score out of 10 for loads of different things what isn't ticking those boxes what isn't getting a higher score yeah exactly <laughs> solid seven <laughs> um but what like is there certain areas so something i like to go through with some of my students and one of my students in particular has achieved some amazing success over the last year and certainly not because of me he was going to achieve it no matter what but something which i did with him was about a year and a half ago i created this check uh, check sheet and there was like improvisation vocabulary mm. sound 
tone, et cetera, et cetera. We went through this whole list. There's a big list of things. Gave himself a score out of 10. Um, and then every six months or every four months, we'd review it. And he'd give himself another score. And to see his progress quantified like that and to see went from a one out of 10 to a four out of 10 to a seven out of 10, he's flying. And we need to do these things. We need to see our progress and identify our weak areas. We've all got them. We'd all be lying if we said we were great at everything. You listen to the greats. You listen to people like Victor Wooten and you listen to all these other people and they say, yeah, I've still got this to work on. Or I'm still working at this or whoever it is and people that we all look up to. We've all got work to do and we've all got weak yeah. areas. Yeah. But my reason behind mentioning this was it's also okay to take a day off. Yeah. It's okay to take some time off. We don't have to be like 24 seven, every second of the day, work, 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 base, base, base. Yeah. It's not healthy. Um, and it's going to go down the, like a really dangerous route, I think, if we start beating ourselves up for not doing a whole day of practice. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Practice is important and development is important, but we don't have to feel like every single second has to be filled with it. If you're feeling uncreative, go out for a walk for an hour, um, if, if the guidelines permit. Uh, go out for a walk around the block, make sure you've got a, f a fresh mind, come back, and normally that really helps and we play it better. Is. But giving well, ourselves time off is important. As you said there, you know, about, about the time you spend with people, the inspiration you get from people, you don't get that if you're locked in a box just doing your own thing all the time. You need to go out and live life. The, um, it's, it's interesting as well, you know, and just to back up what, what Sandy's saying here, um, it, I chat to Scott E all the time, you know, and you talk to Scott, Scott has got uh, Divine, obviously, SBL. Um, Scott will have, this needs to be done by this date, this needs to be done by this date. He has planned for the next year and he is so driven. Um, but he's got mentors that he'll talk to. He's got business people. He watches a lot of seminars and stuff, gets into that. Myself, Mike Mondeser, wonderful bass player, played with Billy mm. Cobb and stuff like that. Um, I've been to see Mike, and Mike's done with me exactly what you're just talking about there. He's like, okay, where are you? What do you need to do? What are mm. your strengths? And he'll tell me what I'm good at. You need to push that, but you need to do it. And, and he was great for that. So there's, everyone should have a mentor. Mm. It's one of the things that with, with bass in mind, that's what's different. You know, um, all the stuff that I put up is free. But it's kind of a catching net for the people that then come and learn with me Right. Because I always teach one to one because I want to be a mentor in someone's life and I want to, you know, address all those things. And I can't do that as well with video lessons. Mm. Um, the come downs happened. Uh, the hiatus started, Sandy, mm -hmm. and, and you're away. Um, life's still been busy for you, though. You've, you, there's been some great workshops uh, that I saw with Yamaha and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then there's a little reunion on the horizon um, uh, that you might want to talk about. And that's, that's Wheaters. Talk to me about that. I was wondering where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I started working um, with We. Well, I, I'm not their main bass player. They've, they've obviously We just have a bass player. They are a band. Um, but we cut the, the boys decided to cover Teenage Dirtbag um, in 2013 during the Take Me Home tour. Um, and from that, I became friends with Brendan, who is the vocalist, the main vocalist from. Um, from Wheatus and some of, some of you guys might remember him like wearing the bucket hat and having the acoustic guitar and it's just he is just an amazing person and an absolutely incredible detailed musician he's just amazing proper mad scientist gets really into it he is wicked um and so we did a single together me and the drummer from One Direction Josh Devine um we did a single together in 2014 uh, which was so much fun it was so nice to kind of do something as a featured artist because it's something I would never, never really have thought about doing. It's I'm very much I love being a session guy. I love being the guy not not at the front of the stage, just that guy just there, just behind on the stage. I love being the session guy. It's, I'm not necessarily the artist in any way. And it was cool to just step away from that a little bit and doing that kind of thing. And yeah, getting getting to be kind of my name was on the single and all those different things. It was wicked. Um, so we did that single in 2014. And then Brendan asked me to play on one of the tracks. Um, they're doing uh, a reissue of that classic Wheatus album with um, Teenage Dirtbag, etc. on there. <laughs> um, all those amazing songs. And we recorded one of the songs that was unreleased at the time. It is amazing. Brendan's really influenced by Rush. Um, so it kind of is very much got those kind of Rush influences in there. So <laughs> For me, it was so much fun and I recorded it from here. And like you just said, remote recording is available to us now and we can yeah. ship things out all over the world. Um, he's, a, he's based out in New York, obviously shipping things back and forth and doing loads of different things. It's just, it's so much more accessible now to be able to reach out. And this is something I've stressed to some of my students recently. Reach out to people, 
ask people like, hey, you want to collab on this? Hey, do you want to do this? Hey, do you want to do that? Most of the time, like people are going to get back and say, yeah, let's do it. Let's yeah. get together. Let's do this. And it's a great opportunity to collaborate with other people and people from all over the world who wouldn't necessarily have met before. Reach out to people. The worst you can hear is nothing at all. The best you can hear is, yeah, let's do it. We haven't lost anything. And again, just being a person and not just being a robot and being like, just shooting out a, a, a blank email to a million different people is exactly the same. Like getting to know someone and getting a kind of rapport and a relationship. I think as a musician, that's so important, the human aspect. And like I say, just actually being genuine and actually caring about what's going on in someone's life rather than just, I'm trying to get a gig out of you. So I yeah. want to pretend like I'm interested. No, like actually be interested, invest in these things because it's important. It's important from a human aspect as well. We have to be involved in people's lives and when we're out on tour, of course, you get to know someone so well, the intricate details of someone's life. You spend every second with them. You get to know them so well. And unlike a normal job where you go home, you clock out at 5 p.m., we're only just beginning, aren't we? We're 5 p.m., we're only just beginning. We've been together all day. We're going to get on stage at whatever it is, 7, 8, 9 p.m. We're good to go. So, yeah, I think just the human aspect of being a musician should never be kind of dismissed. And I think it is really important. I think it's great, mate. I think it's great. Um, Sandy, obviously, what a career, mate. And I really yeah. do. I'm, I'm in awe, mate. I, I, Thank I, you, mate. I, I appreciate what you've done. I know the stresses that it causes and, and environments that aren't natural, even to a gigging musician. You know, a lot of us love the dream. We talk about it. But having to go on that sort of, you know, global status and having to work with all those pressures is absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, what's really great is that obviously uh, you're a mentor and you're sharing all those environments and that, you know, it's very difficult. There's a lot of teachers out there these days that actually haven't had a playing career. You know, they're great teachers and they're recognized for being teachers, but then they're not able to be mentors and say, right, boss LS2, that's what you need for this, this, and this, because right. I used it on this gig. You need this skill, for, you know, you need this skill set for this gig, this skill for this gig. You want to develop these things for that. And, and it's, it's awesome that you're now sharing that uh, and that you're available to people. We're talking about reaching out to people. Obviously, Sandy's got um, uh, a good teaching uh, background with the ACM, mm -hmm. but he's also teaching one-to-one -one remotely now. So if you guys are interested um, to get an insight with, you know, a, a modern legend, then he really is. You know, this is um, it's a good time, as Sandy said, to reach out and touch base with some of these guys because you never know. You might just get a yes. So. <laughs> Um, Sandy, thanks so much for hanging out today. Uh, it's been inspiring, really, really great. And some wicked insights um, to life on the road with, let's not forget, probably one of the biggest bands the world saw. Uh, <laughs> best part of a decade. Let's hope the hiatus isn't too long. Uh, and let's, let's see you back on road. Um, guys, show some love. This guy is Sandy Bills. Uh, this guy is Phil Mann. Uh, this has been With Bass in Mind. Please go and find this gentleman on the net. Subscribe, like. Uh, you'll see him. He's got a little blue tick on Instagram. Um, <laughs> and come and find With Bass in Mind. You never know. I might even chuck up a 1D, One Direction uh, transcription at one point. And we're doing this. It's all good. Guys, I'm Phil Mann. This is With Bass in Mind. We'll see you next time.